I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Duthie, George Duthie, our district architect, to join me. And we're going to talk about um, the proposal for a referendum in this community. There's been a discussion for the last several years about proposals for residential growth. Um, I'm not going to go through every development tonight. Those presentations are on the website. Um, it's well documented. I'll do some overview highlight slides. But we're going to talk about a process that we've gone through. We're going to talk about the plan. And we're going to talk about proposed projects. Um, and I will ask Mr. Duthie to sort of jump in with some specifics as we go. Um, and, and I'm going to just sort of take this and run with it. Um, if there's questions to the board, whether it's on an individual slide or towards the end, I'm happy to, to answer them. Um, we've engaged in a multi-year process where we're looking at our existing facilities, our capacities, and our anticipated growth. All right, so right now, what we know is there are significant needs within our district for facility upgrades. Um, and our community prides itself on providing academic programs for our students. But right now, we're stretched with, what, with some of our schools and some of our programs. And some of the conditions and the qualities of some of our facilities needs to be addressed. Um, some of our schools are at specific ages where things are aging out or um, it's time for upgrades to happen. You know, our, our colleague that uh, was at this table for many years, Mr. Shannick, used to talk about um, the idea of depreciable assets. And the district has about $240 million worth of depreciable assets when we talk about the actual facility, not the land, but the facility. And he talked about a replacement cycle. And he used to talk in terms of a 40-year replacement cycle. And the idea that if you take $240 million divided by 40 years, you'd have about $6 million worth of capital projects per year. But even at that clip, at $6 million, you'd inevitably have projects that, and, and things that are more expensive that you can handle. So for instance, one project we're going to talk tonight is High School North HVAC system. The heating, ventilation, air conditioning system is a $16 million project that needs to be done. Going through a referendum, we get approximately 40% 40, 40 of that project funded. In other words, if we don't do it through a referendum, we would lose $6.4 million for the taxpayers uh, that we can get aid from the, from, the from the state government. So there's reasons to do a referendum and to borrow money. Um, we're at a tipping point when it comes to our capacities and some pressures within our schools. And those of you that were here in March, um, Mr. Duthie and myself, as well as the demographer of the district, Dr. Richard Grip, did a capacity study and we did a, a demographic study. Those are up on the website and you can see the hour presentation that's up on the district website. Uh, both reports are posted under About Us, uh, I think it's under Residential Growth, and they're, they're both there. Um, and they're, they're good reads and there was intense amount of work in the presentation uh, I think helps work to justify some of what we're recommending this evening. Um, and then there's this whole idea that there's state aid to help pay for the projects, to help fund long-term debt through the purpose of a referendum. So the referendum is a mechanism to get dollars um, with this aspect of aid that comes through a referendum process. So we've, we've looked at facility condition. We've We've looked at capacity enrollment. We've done the, the demographic study, including housing, uh, housing analysis. And we've looked at uh, expansion and the need for expansion. Mr. Duthie and I spent, uh, I spend more time with George than I do with most of my family. Um, and we've gone building by building, met with administration, met with staff, looked at nooks and crannies of buildings, um, looked at programmatic needs, looked at programmatic challenges, um, in order to say, and looked at ways to squeeze every space out of our facilities. We've also done some very creative things with funding. And I say creative because most districts cannot and have not been able to utilize capital reserve to do facility expansion the way in which we've been able to employ. And one of the things we've been able to do with that, and there's been some criticism of it, but that criticism is also met with the, un, uh, the, the um, idea that has to be that by using reserve, we've been able to keep the tax impact flat, essentially, on the, on the debt portion of the budget. So we've worked really hard to manage our facilities, thinking long term around our debt payments and around um, the, at what point we knew that at some point we would be at a tipping point. 
So the idea was how many times can you go to this community for a referendum? And we wanted to be mindful to the taxpayers. We've been able to utilize capital reserve to do the expansion here at um, Village, or dare I say the Taj. Um, the board office, as well as growth classrooms, and what's often lost is the six classrooms and two additional resource rooms on the first floor. So eight classrooms plus the OTPT speech offices, child tidy team spaces, um, programs on Village, as well as the district offices that you may recall were in four different facilities prior to this, as well as forget about the health care concerns for the staff that were in some of those buildings. Um, that, that is a whole different conversation. We were able to just vote on Hawk at the last board meeting. So Hawk has now been authorized by this Board of Education, again, out of reserve dollars. Again, mindful to the tax base, utilizing reserve dollars to do an expansion project in Maurice Hawk has uh, been just approved. Uh, we've received state approval. We've gone through all the planning board processes. We've appointed the, the contractor. We've had our first job meeting this past week. And coming to a vote soon, town center schools. As I just mentioned, I'll miss the next uh, committee meetings because uh, Mr. Duthie and I will be at the DPR meeting is the, the uh, development uh, project review committee. Every, every uh, municipality has different acronyms, so I believe that's the right acronym uh, next week. And then we will ultimately be in the planning board uh, in June uh, for town center. Again, out of a reserve action, the reserve action to hold the money was already allocated in the budget that was just passed at April 24th. So there's three project all out of reserve actions by this, by this body in order to, to um, address growth and be mindful of the tax base and meet facility needs for this community and ultimately for the kids we serve. Um, affordable housing, so just big picture. Um, there's a lot of stuff coming. So this is all on the West Windsor side. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's one slide, two slides that comes out of a uh, previous presentation on capacity. So again, if you want to see this in its totality, please see the capacity study. But what you can see here is number of units, number of housing obligations assigned to those units, and the percentage of housing. So you often hear about one in four for West Windsor. Well, that's not true of every housing type that's already been approved or that's already been in front of the, the municipal government. Some of these have been approved outright. Some of these have been um, held on um, in the sense that there's a court, court approval on, like for instance, District 1 Transit Village has been out there for, for um, well, I've been here nine years now, so it's gotta be 12 to 14 years, um, court approved at, at 800 units, 12.2% uh, affordable housing. The only way that changes is if there's a sale and the government chooses to, and the owner comes to an agreement to change that. That's what it is, 100 affordable housing units by the court order. So that 12.2% is not 25% that you might hear about. So when you look at these projects as well as these projects, and you subtally them right there in white, uh, it says 2,386 units or 498 affordable housing units, what you have to keep in mind that when the judge's decision said 1,500 units, 500 of those units will account for 2,400 growth units in West Windsor. So 500 equals 2,400 or 2,386. Now, any deal with any of those other developers could shift that number a bit, but that's what we know of today. So we can assume approximately the credits, the way they'll work, is approximately 600 or so credits. Now look, that's an estimate. And when the township puts forward their ultimate plan, they are gonna have to account for all the credits and what they submit to the judge. So that 600 might be 650, so that 1600 might drop a bit, but it's an estimate. And I have to work on an estimate of the additional credits and additional growth. So what I'm looking at here is 498 plus approximately 600 units is 1,098. We just heard it needs to be, um, it needs to be 1,500 affordable housing. So we can assume there's 402 additional units. If in that 402 additional housing units, that's one in four or 25%, West Windsor would need to create another 1,600 somethings, townhomes, apartments, condos, single family homes, something to meet their housing obligation above and beyond the 2,386. So the total estimate we're going with is somewhere around 4,000 or 3,994 units that have to be built in order to, to meet West Windsor's affordable housing growth. Now that's gonna happen in probably 10 to 12 years, 10 to 15 years. 
It's going to be lots of factors of developers and market saturation and how fast things can grow and what happens to the economy, you know, what new world news changes day to day and how that impacts markets and structures and, okay, you get it, all that kind of good stuff. But doesn't, doesn't eliminate this idea that kids are coming. Houses are coming and the community's coming. Plus there's Plainsboro, which has 395 over at Market Fair plus another 100 on Day Road. So in addition to this 4,000, we have 495 approved units over in Plainsboro. So that's 4,500 units in the, the number one, two, three, arguably best school districts in the state of New Jersey, one of the top 100 in the United States, and two of the best communities to live in in the, in the nation. I promise you the housing market will get saturated. People want to live here. And anyone tells me that there's open housing stock, there's, there's not much open housing stock. They fill, turnover happens. We have, we have corporate mobility in our community. But the housing stock doesn't stay open for long. And we constantly have an influx of students registering. So then how many kids is that? Well, your guess is as good as mine, but I'm, I'm asked to make some guesses. Right, so 3,994 units. If we assume 0.58, so I'll go right to the middle. What's that number represent in West Windsor? That represents the average apartment yield when you extract out age restricted. So when you extract out age restricted housing of our apartment yield, the average yield for an apartment is 0.58. If we assume that most of the housing stock is apartment, because townhomes is actually 0.8, I believe, right? We're going to get around 2,300 growth students in addition to our current 97 to 9,800. The number's always a moving target, but around 9,700 students. So you're talking about going to around 12,000 at build out, assuming it holds at 0.58. Now, if it goes to 0.81, and what 0.81 represents is Woodstone. Now, why is that number maybe a little unrealistic? Is because Woodstone, um, not Woodstone, excuse me, Princeton Terrace, Princeton Terrace. Princeton Terrace at point one. Princeton Terrace is built with no one-bedroom apartments. So that number is most likely a little higher than we would see in, a in an apartment yield. So, and point four is like a low-end um, housing area that has like 25 years of turnover. Like with 20, the community is like 25 years old. So even in a, like a housing community that um, is an older housing section of our community, point four is like the lowest yield we're seeing. So if we're wrong and it's not 0.58, you're still looking at 1,600 kids just in West Windsor. And if we're right and it's 0.58, it's 2,300. And if we're wrong and it's bigger than we think, it's 3,200. And the difference between being on the low end and being right is the population of high school south. Right? 1,600 kid difference between 1,600 and 3,200. That's high school south's current population. So when you're wrong, you're wrong in high school. Now, can you be wrong? Well, this district's been wrong before. When High School North opened, how fast did you build an, an extension on High School North? As soon as we moved in, we put the annex on, right? We built that pretty quick, and why? Because it's really hard to predict this stuff. When Grover opened, Grover opened with class sizes in the high 20s, because it's really hard to project this stuff. So expect, expect to be wrong, but you have to be ready for the growth for the kids, for the staffing needs. Otherwise, what gets impacted is class size. And we have that today. We have class size demand today. Eighth grade at Grover is over 28 in some classes and upwards of 30 to 32 in some sections because 50 eighth graders moved in this past summer. Who could predict that, right? So when you have that kind of rapid growth, when staffing is what it is and there's no rooms available, what gets impacted is class size. And I'm not about to suggest that we should see elementary classes in the high 20s. In fact, the board's own policy would suggest that that's a bad idea. So our goal is to build classrooms in conjunction with or in advance of the growth. And one of the things that's problematic and challenging from a school system perspective is developers get approval, they get the permit, they go. We have to jump through regulatory hoops We've been talking about Hawk expansion for two and a half years, right? We've been working on this. It will take longer to plan and get it approved than it is to build. We've been working on this referendum discussion for two and a half years. And it's been arduous work to take methodical steps
to make sure that we had the best information in, in a timely manner to make an informed decision. And then the affordable housing decision came in. And yes, West Windsor is gonna most likely have to make a decision whether they challenge it or not. But let's, let's be real for a second, if they challenge it. In 2015, when they submitted their affordable housing plan, in December of 2015, they expected over 1,000 units. That's the 2386. That's 2386 or 500 units. So if they, and it's a little bit more, but if, if they win, and they win it all the way back to what they wanted, you're still looking at 2400 plus another 495 over in Plainsboro. But most likely, when the judge came in at 1500, remember fair share housing was at 1976, 1972, something like that in their, their request. So even if the judge split the difference between 1500 and 1000 and went to 1250, you're gonna go higher than 2400 just in West Windsor. So this is what's right on the books. You know, Manili's underway, Woodstone's in front of the planning board t uh, Tuesday, Thursday night. Um, Thursday night, right? Tomorrow. Tomorrow night, thank you, Linda, Wednesday night. Um, Ellsworth Center uh, has a sign on the corner. This Forestal Village in Plainsboro is always delayed. And at some point that's gonna go, but, it, but it's delayed for now. Um, and so, that's, but that's sending, the, that's sending it to Wyckoff. Everything else is sending Hawk, uh, Village, um, Village, um, Maurice Hawk Village, Grover South. Right? Maurice Hawk, Maurice Hawk, Maurice Hawk, all this stuff is sent into Hawk. And that's why we're moving fast on going through the process of through capital reserve dollars, because that's separate than the referendum and it saves about a year on the process. And that's one of the reasons we went the direction we went with Hawk, because time was of the essence. Here's our capacity study, just an overview slide. The far right corner, uh, the column is really what you want to look at, right? And you can see the capacities based on uh, up to the middle schools. Those are large capacities, all over 100. And so when a number goes over 100, you have to ask yourself, well, what changed? And it all goes back to the definitions. If an elementary classroom definition was 20 for a K2 building or K3 building, if you see capacity over 100%, that means the class sizes are over 20. Right, so that's exactly what ha is happening here. All of our class sizes are in the mid, uh, you know, 23, 24. Right? Yes, in kindergarten you see some lower, in first grade you see some lower. But second grade, third grade, we're definitely seeing those mid-20s, lower to mid-20s. So, Hawk already is the most stretched. And remember, in order to gain space here at Village, we're gonna have to move the four pre-K classrooms out of here to Hawk. So that gains the four classrooms growth we expect to need here at Village. And, but you get a sense, like we have, uh, I'll show you a slide on community in a little while. Community is gonna go up just, uh, just around 175, 177 kids, based on kids that are born and in school district today. Not based on residential growth, based on residents that are here. So the plan is looking at a couple different things. We're gonna look at short-term and long-term, or short-term and long-term, or short-term and near-term, facility needs, we're gonna look at our current capacity issues, we're looking at our enrollment growth due to new housing, and we're gonna look at these four areas in the referendum. We're looking at life safety, air quality, programmatic needs, and short-term and near-term residential growth. So those are our four big categories we're gonna, we're gonna hit on. So, short-term. Critical projects like life safety and security, indoor environment, uh, programmatic spaces, big picture, classrooms, arts, music, dance, theater. Look, there, there's, um, there's a requirement or a recommendation you have a dance program. Well, it's hard to have a dance program when you don't have a dance studio. You need a specific type of floor and you need an instructional space. The auditorium stage is not such a space. Right? They would be displaced over 30 something days a year due to the way in which the high school auditoriums are used. Due to testing, due to assemblies, due to park. You know, those become testing locations. The stage gets used for the plays for months at a time, and those stage setups happen. So, it, this, and it's not a sprung floor, which means it's not safe to be dancing on over and over again, repetitive dance. You need to have specific types. So those kind of things we want to do, but we need space. Our community values, well, our community adores science, and they should. But right now at High School South today, we already are out of classrooms. Next year, we don't have enough classrooms. So what do you do? You use something, forgive the term, but it's just a, 
a, a scheduling term of art called the area of refuge, right? So you put the kids somewhere else, and then on lab days, you switch them around. So they're not in a lab. They're in a health science cl classroom or a world language classroom. And on lab days, they switch. And we're already doing that at South today based on the population. And South is, already, is only increasing. How do you stop that? You, you restrict electives. Now, I'm not going to be the superintendent. I've done a lot of things. But I'm not the superintendent that's going to go out and suggest that you can't take science after your junior year. Right? You can't take two APs in a year for, for junior and seniors in science. Right? That's not a winning plan for kids. That's not a winning plan for community. It's not instructionally sound. But that's where we're getting to if we don't do something to address our facilities. The only way to stop it the de is to cut the demand. So we have a demand issue. It's a good problem, but it needs to be addressed based on kids that are in school today. Technology and robotics. Yes, we built a, a, a robotics studio at, at North based on need. But we didn't build a robotics studio at South. We built space, and we started the process, and we put equipment, and we put ventilation, and we put emergency stops, and we've done that kind of stuff. But it's not big enough. The space wasn't intended for robotics. So we need to do something. Both middle schools' robotics rooms need upgrading and work. Our culinary space at both high schools needs complete overhauls. Their old school, old way culinary arts was created. Think, um, think domestic cooking versus top chef, right? I mean, it's, it's just culinary arts has completely changed. But the spaces our kids teach and are, 30, are learning is 30-something years old. So they're in stations with four. And one was washing the dishes while another one is mixing the ingredients. It, the physical space doesn't allow the instructional learning to happen the way it should. In our media centers, we believe in books. We believe in having rich learning environments. But our libraries are old, and they need to be refurbished. And they need new carpets, and they need paint, and they need some shelving work, and all that kind of things. I should say this entire presentation will be online tomorrow morning. So anyone taking notes, please know that this will be out there publicly on the district website tomorrow. Critical capacity, the life safety stuff. We're going to get into that, but that's some generators, and that's, um, that's security vestibules at our front doors. Um, and that's the fire alarm systems at eight of our schools that need to be upgraded. You know, the, no, the number of false alarm calls, the number of times kids go outside because we have um, alarm panels go off because of shorts. I know our police department sent us warning letters about how many times they have to come out at night because they're not happy about having to respond to yet another time where the, the alarm goes off in the middle of the night or during the school day and kids are brought outside for no reason. By the way, that doesn't count as a fire, fire drill. Right? That's not allowed by code. Um, and then there's the whole idea of capacity and construction. Large additions, existing buildings or small additions, figuring out what to do. And then taking the demographic report that Dr. Grip did, the capacity study that we did, and then blending that to say, this is a plan. And then there's the whole how you're going to fund it piece, which I believe the township's going to be really pleased with, not like some of our neighboring districts. So the plan is a November uh, referendum. Why in November? Well, there's two main reasons. One, if you do it outside in November, you have to pay additional cost. Right, you have to run a special election, and there's another thirty to 50000 because of the two communities to run a special election. Second thing is you've got to sell bonds. And so if you do it in December, there's not enough time from a state, state um, aid perspective to be processed at the end of the year. So November makes much more sense. It's $115 million. It's a large number. It can be a scary number. There's rehabilitation and renovations in that. But here's what we're planning to do, a zero tax impact. So we're talking about $115 million referendum for a zero tax impact. So the question then becomes, like, how do you do that? So there's three ways. One is retiring debt, and we have money coming off the books in 2022, 2026, and 2028. Then there's state aid, and we're estimating between 20 and 25%. One of the things the board is being asked to do tonight is to submit the projects to the Department of Education for the perspective of analyzing the allocation of aid for each project. It's a required element to go to referendum. It requires board action months in advance of making a determination whether you'll vote for a referendum question. So it's just a necessary part of the process. 
voting for that to be submitted to the Department of Ed tonight does not obligate this, does not obligate this Board of Education to bring the question forward in November. All it does is authorize the submission for the aid determination from the department, which is required to put the referendum question forward. I uh, just want to make sure that everyone's comfortable with that idea that you are not authorizing the project tonight. You're authorizing the submission so the department can review the application to determine the aid allocation, project by project. You guys all right? You're all looking up, just making sure. All right. And then the, sec the third part to this puzzle is utilizing capital reserve. The community and some members have questioned the balance. F it's fair. One of the things we're looking at is in order to keep the payment flat, and you can see that line that runs right down the middle. The green represents, let me frame this bigger. This um, funding chart is based on the idea of a recommendation from our bond council for two notes followed by bonds over 20 years. All right, so you see early on in 2020 and 2021, smaller amounts in yellow, and then you can see the line going across. What many members of the community may not be aware is that we pay our debt out of general fund. So we are allowed by law to collect the debt above and beyond 2%, because that's money that's been authorized by, by this community. We have been able over years to move that debt payment into our general fund account. And that's been going on for somewhat 14, 15 years we've been working on that and been able to maintain it. So you can see in that green line, that line that goes across where the green's the highest peak is about 7.7, 7.8 million. In order for this scenario to work, it assumes that the board will continue the $7.8 million payment out of general fund, hence the line that goes straight across. Anything above that line needs to be covered with capital reserve dollars. So in other words, we will continue to pay the debt portion of the, the referendum out of reserves going forward, hence the ability to carry a zero uh, increase on the debt portion of the, of the, of the referendum. That doesn't mean that we won't still see a tax increase, right? You always have salaries and benefits and energy costs and transportation and special ed costs. That's always going to move up a little bit. But on the debt portion of the, of, the, of the budget, we believe that we can cover the yellow, the above the 7.7 .7 line, out of capital reserve, thereby maintaining a zero. Therefore, there's not a tax spike for the, for the community. Now, you can see that there's dips, 2022, 2026, and 2028. Some may argue that if you don't do this referendum, the taxpayers would get a tax relief and that this is unnecessary. Well, that's an argument some can make. I would make the counter argument that if you don't do this, what might feel like temporary relief will get countered by the increase uh, of the year yearly taxes. And ultimately, when the facilities become so diminished, you're going to need to do a referendum much more than what we're suggesting at this point. Because I don't anticipate being this the only referendum. This is the beginning of growth in our community. This will get us through the first thousand students, growth. But we're projecting in 12 years, potentially over 2,000. So if you miss this opportunity, the only way you can pay for it is by going above the 2% to carry the differential. So the board is going to have to make a strategic decision on how to capitalize on expiring debt, capital reserve, and, needs, and ultimately funding from the DOE for a percentage of project cost. That's a lot right there, and we haven't talked about a real project yet. So before we start diving into some project specifics, I just want to take a moment of pause on this particular slide and ask the board members if there's any particular questions about the, the, you know, how we keep this at zero. I have a question. Um, when have, have you planned out the timeline of when these additions would be built to line up with when the developments will be built, number one. And number two, when you hire all the teachers and staff for these additional spaces, 
that will increase taxes. And have you done an analysis of what the increased tax will be when there is full build out that you're planning with this referendum? Right. So there's, there's a lot to that question. Um, with respect to the actual build out of which facility at what, which point, um, the referendum authorizes the expenditure on these buildings. Um, because of immediate space constraints at Grover Community, um, well, f I should say, outside of the referendum, Hawk is moving. Outside of the referendum, the town center is moving, that we'll be bringing forward that. Um, I believe by the time we go through planning board, get DOE approvals, we should probably be, um, probably be somewhere between August and September, separate and apart from the referendum. So those projects will be moving at a faster clip than some of the others. If the referendum gets approved in November and the board authorizes it first, and then if it was to be approved in November, then we would be working with uh, George and the architects on the scope and sequence of the other se uh, five projects. Community would be the number one project we put forward because those students are in district today. South would be another one. Now, as I say that, because South has space demands today, there is a component of packaging projects because you, you can bid multiple projects at the same time. One of the reasons you want to do that is contractors have authorized bid thresholds of what they're allowed to do. The bigger the project, the bigger the, the, bigger the developer, the bigger the con contractor. So if you put a $3 million, $4 million project, there's a lot of mom and pop construction companies that could apply for that work. But if you put a $4 million project together with a $25 million project, they have to have quite the um, profile, portfolio of, um, in, order, in order to bid that work. So, and then once you have that developer on, then you have to work with them on the scope and sequence of the project. So it's, with respect to the timeline, it's, it's a little complicated because it's based on who the contractor is, how the work is packaged, and quite frankly, not all those details have been worked through, but we've been thinking about how do you package that. With respect to the staffing, one, it, it happens a couple of ways. One, it happens out of the general fund we, could, because we don't anticipate that 100% of every room is done, is, is, is filled in day, day one the building opens. So you're going to have some space additions that, not that they're sitting empty, but they're not 100% utilization in every room day one, which is why you're building capacity. So some of it's going to happen in the natural component of, of the building. But if growth happens so rapidly that, and Chris, uh, this is Dr. Russo, is it above 5%? Enrollment growth is when you're allowed to go to the SGLA for, for funding. I believe it's 3 5 percent? Yeah, 4 percent. 4 percent. So there, there's a funding mechanism under the state that says if your enrollment increases, and we'll use Dr. Russo's 4 percent, 4 percent enrollment increase, the board is allowed to authorize a tax increase to the community above and beyond the 2 percent in allowances. And it's called something called an SGLA, uh, Spending Growth Limitation Adjustment. So there is a mechanism under the law that allows you to expand beyond your 2% uh, and, and, and allowances. So your allowances are usually through bank cap, your allowances are through health care adjustments, and your allowance is through um, enrollment growth at a certain clip. This Board of Education has the right today to take additional, what, 1.2, 1.5 million to the taxpayers under the SGLA today in our, in our budget we just approved. But we didn't do that because we, don't need, we didn't need to ask the, board, the community and the Board of Education for that authorization. We could have done that without a taxpayer vote today. Um, and I just think that that's important because I mean, we're looking at how do we manage, uh, how do we constantly manage the, the t hit and the taxpayer impact. Um, so there, you know, there, are, there are strategic decisions that are made um, around this. So there are mechanisms that allow for rapid growth for an adjustment. But again, to your point, Ultimately, that decision goes to the taxpayers um, through, a pa in, uh, through a tax increase. So one of the reasons that we are so mindful of our enrollment projections and working on the staffing ratios with our high schools and our middle schools in particular, and ultimately our elementary is in class size, is because every staff member costs from the perspective of salary, benefits, and additional, additional um, whether it's workers' comp or other, other components of what factors in the total cost of an employee. Right, so have you looked at that and figured out what that number is and how it would affect the typical homeowner? It's, it's difficult to project that at this time because it's going to be contingent on the on the year-to-year -year growth. It, Dr. Russo, did you want to jump in? I said time value of money is going to change right. over time, the value of the property today, et cetera. Right. 
And as new rateables come on, it, it could impact the tax. It, it, so it's a little hard to project right now, and that's going to be a moving target over time. So uh, it, it's, it's fair. I just don't have the, all the details to answer that kind of question. But what, we're, what we know is that for every 20 to 25 students, you're adding a teacher at the elementary schools. For every 100 students, you're adding approximately five, student, five teachers at the middle schools um, and, 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 and five to seven because of electives. So you start thinking in terms of that at the middle school and the high school. Um, remember, and this is the way I, I, I think about um, the number of enrollment growth. 100 students equals seven course requests, all right? So 100 students equals 700 courses that need to be signed up for. If every student class average at the high school is 25, right, that would be, if we divide 25 into 700, um, it, it's worth um, 35 sections worth of class. The average high school teacher by contract can teach five sections, which means 700 schedule requests with 25 class average equals 35 sections equals five teachers. Or seven teachers, seven teachers. <laughs> I had it right until the end, equals seven teachers. So 100 students growth at the high school and the middle school is seven teachers growth. And so we start to have to look at the projections each year, and that's why we work with the facilities committee and the finance committee, and we work with our teachers and our, our principals, excuse me, and our budget managers as our supervisors, so hard to look at our, our staffing ratios. There's supervisors in this room that hate those meetings. They're Martin and my favorite meeting um, <laughs> when, we, when we start there, and make them justify their growth. And so we do that as a matter of practice now for eight, nine years. Since I came in, we've, we've started that practice. Because staffing matters and staffing ratios drive costs. And we've been very fiscally prudent when it comes to that staffing to manage the appropriate balance of you want to make sure that you have appropriate staffing, but you also have to be fiscally responsible to the taxpayer. So I'm going to move us past this slide. Um, I'm going to let George talk about life safety as I take a drink of water and get him into this conversation. So, Mr. Duthie. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Slide 21 out of 300. No, just kidding. No, 51. As Dave said earlier, we have looked at a lot of different aspects. Oh, sorry. A lot of different. Oh, there it is. A lot of different aspects of all of the facilities. It's been a process that's been going on for a number of years now. Uh, and we've narrowed down the most, and we're not dealing with all of the needs at this time, okay? I think that needs, it's a measured approach to the things that were felt to be the most critical capital projects. And one of those categories is indoor environmental quality. And what we've looked at in particular is one very, I would say, obsolete system common to all of the school buildings, and that's the automatic temperature controls. So there's going to be a modernization, which has already started. And I want to say this, because this is very, very important. The district has already undertaken many capital projects and has made many improvements to the schools. You know, there was a rod grant program uh, that the Department of Ed had, several allocations, four allocations. There was 40% uh, in the grant program paid by the state for eligible projects. West Windsor Plainsboro had hundreds of those projects. Now they weren't all done, but the district received a lot of money from the state for those grants. And that was money they were able to fund, again, with local share, dollars on hand. And many of those types of projects were completed at that time, okay? So these kinds of things have been ongoing. They're constantly assessed. But High School North right now Millstone River and Wyckoff have been identified as buildings that need, not the only buildings that need this type of work, but the most critical projects at this time. The problem with these projects is they're very expensive. The good thing about these projects is they're eligible for debt service aid at 40%. So if the project is $10 million, the state pays $4 million of that project in the form of debt service aid over the period of the bond, which is 20 years, usually. Okay? Also, HVAC system upgrades in the classrooms. When we're talking about classroom upgrades, air quality, ventilation improvements, dehumidification, as well as chillers and boilers at High School North systems are simply 
beyond their useful life. The building's 20 years old almost. Millstone River School, classrooms and core spaces. We're gonna be taking care of some of those. And again, at Wyckoff School. So I'm gonna go school by school, talk about projects, show some of the maps, uh, talk through this. Um, again, it will be up on the website tomorrow. The board doesn't authorize anything tonight except the submission of the projects to the state. So there's time to talk about this. So I'm gonna go through it at a little bit of a faster clip. Um, but here we go, High School South. Eight science classroom addition, approximately 25,000 square feet. New main entrance, if you're at High School South right now, you walk into a cafeteria, you walk into a commons. There is no separation from a safety perspective. So we're recommending a new main office. And in that addition, I'll show you a footprint in a moment. Four classrooms, robotics, dance studio, in that section of 15,000 square feet. The renovation of the existing main office because we have a need for a proper child study team office, a prop proper guidance office. So that whole area has to be redesigned to create space. Uh, renovation of the early childhood classroom as well as the culinary arts classrooms, uh, new media center, gutting the media center, uh, security vestibule at the school, as well as a renovation to the little theater. Anyone that's been in that little theater knows it's outdated, knows the chairs need to go. You pull those chairs, you need to carpet the whole place, new sound system, new speaker system, paint the place. It needs a complete rehab. Um, adding a refurbishing of 800 A and B, as well as um, additional robotic space at South. So it's a little hard to see, but bottom here is the new addition in the, sorry. It's actually in the top here. The pointer's not working. It's a little hard to see in the gray. Um, it's the gray area in the top. It might be worth dimming the lights, but here we go. This section right here would be the new science. This would be the new main office and robotics in this, in, in this area. So looking at this a different way. Thank you, Mr. Dalton, Mr. Russo, Dr. Russo. How many assistant superintendents does it take? <laughs> well, one's leaving, so. <laughs> Superintendent to Brick, Superintendent. So. We're losing the guy that knows how to work the lights. We do, we are. <laughs> <laughs> There's, so top right, you can see a space coming off. I'm giving up on the pointer because it's not working. It's four science classrooms. You see that pot of four classrooms, top right of the purple. That would be our new science addition. There would be a second floor that mimics it. Um, ultimately, you can see that dotted area in between. That provides a space for a potential growth um, eight classroom addition, first floor, second floor. So it gives the potential of connection for a future 16 classrooms built into the footprint. So it's prepared for future growth should we ever grow larger. The media center is in purple there. You can see the green classrooms, two next to the media center, two staggered top left. That would be the fourth cl four classrooms growth. Above that in blue on the right hand side next to the media center would be a new dance studio. To the left, the dance studio, well, right underneath it, you can see sort of like a combination of blue and orange and yellow there. Those are changing rooms and office space for the dance staff. On the left-hand side, in orange, top left, that would be the new main office, an entry system with a secure vestibule right there. And then you can see going across on the left-hand side, the three classroom stagger, two and one. That's 800 A and B with a brand new robotics classroom staggered above it. So it gives renovations, it gives space for our science classrooms that are desperately needed, Cla additional classroom growth, 12 classrooms plus a dance studio plus robotics. Um, it's, it's approximately 14 classrooms total plus renovations, uh, 14 times the 25, right? So it gives you around 350 student growth over at High School South. Uh, the guidance child study team area is currently current main office, it guts the existing principal space and the main office outside area where the secretaries are. It builds some conference rooms in for parents to have meetings with child study team and guidance. And it creates actual offices for child study team members that are in old makeshift closets. And it, it just the space configurations here is, is somewhat insane. But it's just what South has used based on staff. That's the current um, between Commons 1 and uh, Commons 1 in the pit is the main office section in the middle of the building that would be refurbished and gutted. The only area that's not in color is the nurse's office. So basically that area that's in white there is the existing nurse's office at South. Uh, can you go back yep. to that slide? 
You're saying that that pink area is the current common? That's no, that's the no. current main office. That's the current main next office. to the commons, next to the yes. Oh. So it's the current like if you know where the um, second floor staff area is, yeah. that's underneath it. Right. That's okay. the current main office. The all the walls in the current guidance area through the child study team and the principals area will get ripped out and that whole new area will get reconfigured to fit the number of uh, guidance counselors that we have, the, the need for our child study team space, conference space for meetings for parents with the child study team. There's not appropriate facilities but for those. you're not actually adding space. There's not, that's not an add, that's a refurbishing. Okay. That's a renovation area. Okay. Um, okay, so that's south, north. Security vestibule, the addition, so you see an addition for north, and we don't often think of what we've talked about for north as an addition, but the dance studio is additional square footage, so it has to be approved as an addition for the purpose of state submission. So it's 2,600, uh, it's behind the current theater. So it's outside, if you're facing the building, to the right of the facility. Um, the media center renovation, the culinary arts renovation, and then IEQ, which stands for indoor air quality, uh, indoor environmental quality. Um, I guess that would be IAQ, but indoor environmental quality. And this is the, an old, complete overhaul, new boilers, chillers, controls, electrical upgrades. It's 16 million and change for this, for, this addition, for this work. The lead time on the units to be produced is something like a year and a half for the manufacturer, a year to year and a half by the time it's authorized. This does not happen fast because its system has to be designed and it has to be specifically built based on the specifications. This is a big project. North, uh, again, the dance studio, we're looking at north from above. The drive is coming from the top in to the staff parking lot across the front. You can see to the left-hand side, um, there is a grayed area which has some words in it that actually says something like dance studio, but I can't read that. That's how bad my vision is. Um, so that's the new addition right there on the left-hand side. Um, and then that's the, 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 the parking lot uh, on the left um, and then football field, obviously, bottom right. So it's the left, it's the front right when you pull into the school. Um, and you can see it's, 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 it's basically back of the building, changing rooms, uh, as well as uh, facilities for the staff in that, in that area. It's a, a curricular program ad, a staffing ad when you offer this program. It may look like half and a half, like theater has grown up in both schools, and then as student interest demands, you hire full. And if student interest demands a full teacher at both schools, we hire a full teacher. So ultimately, the student course requests drive our master schedule. So student interest always drives. So whether we hire one or two teachers when we open is gonna be completely contingent on student interest. Thomas Grover. Thomas Grover has some really high class sizes today. Um, so we know we need an addition, and all the stuff that's happening in West Windsor feeds to Hawk Village Grover South. So the growth that's coming that we know of today in West, in West Windsor is all feeding towards Grover. Um, and the security vestibule, the renovation of three existing science classrooms. So what that means is there are currently not a 12 science classrooms at Grover. Nine of the 12 are outfitted for science. Three of the 12 are not. They are just classrooms that have been utilized for science because the building didn't have enough classrooms or science um, oriented to begin with. So it's the conversion of three to make them proper science rooms, a, a renovation of the current robotics tech lab, and then a two-story addition, which is an additional nine classrooms and three science rooms. That allows for three full teams to be added. Every team has language arts, math, science, in social studies, four teachers on a team. You need 12 classrooms per team. Specials go in those classrooms when those rooms are not used for the, the, the general uh, classrooms or the core classrooms. Um, and then also three resource rooms. So that is a 15 classroom addition, 12 large, three um, small group instruction or smaller for, for some of the special ed programming. It's about 22,000 square feet of program. At Grover, where does it go? You can see there a little clearer top left. It's the addition off the sixth and seventh grade hallways and it connects with an L. Um, and so it, it goes and it connects the building in the top left corner. All right, so again, um, classrooms, science labs, resource rooms, media centers, and overview. And, and then the, sorry, and then the, um, you can see the classroom layout is basically 
um, the four classrooms with two science, and then the other floor is five and one, I believe five and one, to give you the, the 12. And then there's some small group resource rooms intermixed in there. So you're adding 12 classrooms? It's, it's 12 ge general size classroom, three resource, and renovation of three. So it's actually 15 new classrooms, plus three renovated classrooms, uh, plus the renovated robotics room, so technically four renovated rooms. Community is a monster addition. So let me frame this by saying, as Community Middle School has grown up, it's had two additions already. But it's never had core space addition. And we're at that point where we no longer fit in the music space, the gym, or the cafeteria. So you have to expand your core areas in all those programs. And I have two former, or one former and one current community middle school principals in the room that could attest that that building is stretched to its max. It already has split shift lunches today, 20 minute lunch, 20 minutes outside. The kids come outside and then they go inside, inside, outside, which means in 20 minutes, 200 plus students are going through the lunch lines, scarfing food and going outside. And then the kids that were running outside come in, throw their stuff down, go through the lines, try to eat in 20 minutes, and then go to class. It's, it's a horrible setup. It's a setup for indigestion. I mean, it's, 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 it's not a way to live long term, and we have been. Ever since I've been here, we've had that concern of, of split shift lunches. So in order to address the needs at community, you need to do something about the gym because you need to do something about the cafeteria. You need to do something about the library because you need to do something about the music space. So you're impacting four critically and monstrous locations in a school. The gym, the library, the cafeteria, and, and the music space. In addition, a renovation of the theater. And anyone who's been over a community knows that theater needs some significant work. So it also has the renovation of robotics lab, and just like Grover doesn't have proper science classrooms, there are only six designated science classrooms that are appropriately set up for science at community. Six additional rooms are being used as science rooms that are not meant for science. So in this, there is either the renovation of six or something we're talking about, but it has a similar price point, is in the addition to make that science classrooms there and just repurpose the existing six science classrooms to general classrooms. So some of this is a little bit of a work in progress as we work this through. But you're talking about the auditorium renovations, a new gym, the conversion of the current library to a new music space, a brand new library added, expansion of the cafeteria by going into the existing gym, expanding serving and prep lines, relocation of one whole locker room, which is currently uh, the um, girls' locker room, we get a brand new locker room. And the addition of another wing, 12 classrooms, which includes, oh no, it's 12 classrooms plus four science classrooms, plus small group instruction rooms. So the total additions are 31,000 square feet, and then all the renovations. Includes pushing out the main office because we need to, our child study team doesn't have a proper space. They're in like three closets off the main hallway. And there's no proper child study team place. So any family that goes over there for a meeting with our child study team is in spaces that are not conducive for proper meetings. And with this number of students, we have to expand our nursing facility. So this comes from the demographic report. This is based on children that are in district um, today in a five-year projection. You can see an expectation that community is gonna not only, with our current space constra constraints and the split shift lunches, plus 175 kids based on children that are in district today. Quite frankly, this is why you do a demographic report because some of this was blind to us in our numbers and community has to be addressed. It's always been a concern, but this just absolutely exclamation point made us, we had to do something when this, when this came out through the report. These aren't children that were born and are projected. These are kids that are in elementary school now. All right, so seeing it, basically you're going across the top. I'm oh, sorry, across the bottom. Um, so you can see the bottom road is, is Grover's Mill. 
and you can see where that driveway loop is right there. The gray on the bottom, left going from left to right, um, is the new gym, a new security entrance, the new main office expansions, the thin part there. Uh, then on the, to the right in the middle, the library jutting out, and the 16 classrooms section to the right, all the way to the right, connecting to this two-story wing. So basically, it goes in the front of the building all the way across. It is maximizing the footprint of the facility, at the same time um, addressing the needs of the school. What's not shown on this is the renovations in the middle. I'll flip to a different slide. I see a question. Is, there, is that white area over there new, and is it connected just by going outdoors to the other building? It's Millstone. Oh, it's Millstone. Uh, the white on the right is Millstone. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's just hard to see with the footprint. Yeah, that's Millstone to the right. It's part of the uh, butterfly effect of Millstone River. Okay. Um, this is the same map that's here, now with actually an actual layout. And what you see in the middle there is the theater. Um, it's, it's the theater. In, uh, so you have, I'm going left to right in the green, the gym, and you can see the cafeteria into the gym, which is the middle, the green to the left. And then the middle is the current auditorium with the stage. Then you have that two sections that are white. Those are the two music rooms right now. Then the library is to the right in green. That is um, currently the library that will be repurposed for a music section. Drop below that straight down in blue. You see that big blue square in the middle on the bottom. That would be the new library space designated. Hallway connecting to the, to the new um, 16 classroom edition, eight and eight above. And on the left-hand side, I skipped that part. That's the new gym, a new locker room, and then a new secure vestibule uh, uh, office space and storage area. And night, night lobby, one of the challenges in this particular building is that there's no way to secure necessarily um, use from the rest of the building. So we create sort of a boxed off area for those that are coming specifically for the gym. And there's a lot of basketball program use at community. The gym's larger than now. We can actually fit bleachers on both sides and have a proper competition against Grover. I mean, I went through some of the specifics. This just gives a little bit bigger. One of the other challenges here is just logistically, the eating stations, the, 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 the lines which kids go through is not sufficient. So it creates expanding serving areas at, at community. Um, this is, the, again, the classroom space, just a little different detail. You can see this, again, if you're interested, spe more specifics. It's important to know that as these plans are here, they're preliminary. And there's going to be a lot of small changes that happen when we meet with staff. Because what happens in the process is you bring the, the staff members that are impacted by the facility together with the architect, with the administration, with uh, central administration, to go through every area. So right now, we still have to sit down with the music staff and actually specifically design to, their, to some of their programmatic needs. And we'll have the music supervisor, and we'll have Mr. Duthie, and we'll have Dr. Carter and her assistant principals, and, and some central office representation, all in a room. And we'll go through it, and then we'll talk about, and you're going to see tweaks as this goes forward, but that's part of the planning process. And ultimately, as jobs get authorized, we'll do more specific presentations about the specific layouts. These are all conceptual design layouts. And I promise you that over time, if we go back and analyze these against what ultimately gets approved in two or two years or three years, you're going to say, well, there's slight tweaks. And that's because there's a process that we have to go through. And that's very typical, and that's completely normal, and this is part of the, part of the uh, process. Wyckoff is another facility with tremendous space needs. Um, Wyckoff is such that every nook and cranny of that building is used, and that those nooks and crannies as that building is turning 100 years old, that just like Dutch Neck, uh, in a year, um, Wyckoff will turn 100, and there's upgrades and facility needs there. For instance, there's one room for staff bathroom in the entire building. So in the renovation, we're adding in faculty bathrooms. There's lines every day on every prep period for teachers waiting to go to the bathroom. Students, there's one, two, one male, one female, student bathrooms in the entire building. It's in the front right across from the main office. We need to add another set of bathrooms for that building. If we're doing this, it would be almost irresponsible not to add in facilities for the, the staff and the students. Security vestibule will be a little challenging to anyone that knows the layout of Wyckoff. 
because, but it's most likely going to be on the upper level, right, where we have on the, what right currently is the awning. I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be up there because then you're on landings and that's very challenging. Um, the indoor um, environment quality, there's control upgrades as uh, Mr. Duthie talked about. There's HVAC, there's basement rooms that have no ventilation or poor re ventilation in them currently. There's classroom upgrades which need steel and roofing. And I'm going to say the word asbestos because when you have old buildings, it's not illegal or unhealthy to have asbestos. But when work is done to facilities that had the original like asbestos tiles and stuff like that, you have to do a very specific asbestos abatement plan in order to protect that there's no asbestos in the fibers and whatnot get into the air system. So things get taped off and facility has to be shut down and specific cleaning protocols have to, be ha have to happen. And there is an asbestos management plan that every building is required to have by code. So this is just sometimes a scary word, but I want to put it out there that this is, very, this is ex to be expected in buildings, uh, especially older buildings. Um, as you go through renovations. So you have to build in the money because it's a rem the remediation process takes some time and it's costly. Um, a new addition is about 8,400 square feet and it's four kindergarten classrooms and a child study team office. Again, a lot of these buildings weren't built, like 100 years ago, they weren't building a building and saying, hey, we need a child study team office. That didn't exist when Wyckoff was, was built and when the additions were built, they weren't necessarily thinking about the growth of the child study team and services that schools need. Some of these services have expanded over time. We need to make sure that the staff that works with the children have the appropriate space. And, and I already mentioned um, staff and student bathrooms. So it's, it's, I should say it's new staff and student bathrooms, but it's also renovation of the current staff and student bathrooms. So the, t the bathrooms that exist today would be renovated, and then there's new sets as well going into this facility. And then something that Wyckoff has none of, not one closet for storage. Every storage closet has been transformed into a staff office. So there is no actual building storage except for the um, one storage for the, on the, like the loading dock, which is a very small dock for paper and toiletries. But the school itself has no place for instructional materials, supplies, storage. This builds a, a, a reasonable size storage classroom of 100, 120 square feet, something about 200 square feet, I believe it is. So in Wyckoff, when we look at enrollment projections, we're up about 50, but that's not including, like, and, uh, this is based on vital statistics live birth data, but it doesn't necessarily take into effect what's gonna happen when Princeton Terrace goes. It's assuming Day Road, but it's not necessarily assuming Princeton Terrace. Not Forrestal. Princeton Terrace, Forrestal. sorry. Uh, Princeton Forrestal, Princeton Forrestal. I'm getting to the 10 o'clock hour, I'm mixing up my Princetons. Uh, Princeton Forrestal. So again, 52 growth, you say, well, that's small. But there's zero classrooms open today. So if we assume that every grade level might need some form of expansion, we have to pick up a space. So by adding the 4K, what you do is you open up the current three kindergarten. So you can have one growth first, one growth second, one growth third. So essentially it gets us from six classroom of every grade to seven classrooms of every grade. And it goes from three um, elementary kindergarten classrooms to four. So in other words, you can fit the seven sections. You might have half a classroom open every day, which would ultimately be used by services, like OTPT speech would use that overflow space. Maybe the ESL program might use that space. But you have other services that are needed for kids that would go into those rooms when that room's not being used. It's very rare for rooms to sit uh, vacant. And we also have then looked at the footprint to say, okay, if to you expand again, where? So here we are in Wyckoff's property. Wyckoff's like a diamond, I mean like a triangle, like an arrowhead. Long across the top and narrows in down the, down, the, down the sides coming in on like a triangle, right? So if you can envision this, the existing building, the original building is the top corner. And then you have the expansion is that like little addition hallway and then the expansion across the back. The section we're building off of, if you can imagine being inside of Wyckoff, in the bottom corner is the library. So it builds off of the library wing. Why is this a good area to design? You don't impact the parking lot, you do not impact the current playground, and you do not impact the current ball fields. It's the easiest location to build with the least disruption to the building. So what that hallway looks like, as you extend out, if we're on the right hand side, the top left big square is the library, the existing library. Across the hall from that in orange, or some kind of salmon, um, it, it would be the revised um, guidance office ch uh, conference space. That current um, conference space is the current child study team office where three people are. 
It, it leaves it as a conference space, so now we have a space for families to meet the guidance counselor, families to meet the child study team office. And this would be the only conference room in that building. There's currently no conference room in that building. And then it builds three child study team offices into the facility. Across the hallway in yellow there are the student bathrooms. Up again next to the salmon are, are the two staff bathrooms. And then you see the four growth kindergarten rooms. And each kindergarten room by code is required to have a bathroom. Dutch neck. Toilet room re renovations. Again, a 100-year-old building. Those, those bathrooms need to be renovated at Dutch neck as well. Security vestibule. But because of the um, section and how it needs to be designed, it's going to go into the room to the left, which is currently a faculty room, and like a faculty workspace. So it requires the faculty workspace to be redesigned to gain space for the security vestibule to come in. So that requires a little bit of a repurposing of that front entrance way. Bollards are... Think of those poles by gas station pumps that protect cars from knocking over the gas station. It creates a row of those kind of poles across the front. If you're at Dutch Neck right now, what separates kids from buses? Nothing. A yellow line. So what this does, it puts a security line of bollards across the front. It requires a little bit of a widening to the left of the current drive that goes in front of the building to get this in. It will not take out all the grass. It should not take out the trees, um, at least the... We're trying to preserve the trees. It might require cutting back, um, but we're trying to preserve those, that tree line. We're not going to know that until we're done with all the engineering work. And then the media center gets renovated at Dutch Neck. Dutch Neck is one of the buildings that's had a lot of work done to the HVAC system and, and the facility over the last couple of years. Going back ten to fi five to ten years, we've had a lot of work done at Dutch Neck. Hawk, uh, again, Hawk's got the current ref um, project that's going separate than the referendum. The only addition to Hawk at this point is some work to the, the media center that was not done inside the referendum. Town center, again, moving separately than the referendum. Um, media center, security vestibule. Those two pieces are separate and apart. And then village. Village has had work done as well. Media center, security vestibule, and those two locations as well. Millstone, four, five and a half, six million dollars worth of HVAC work. The big project here is HVAC, media center, security. But I can't underscore the amount of work that's going to be required here in, H in HVAC, the heating, ventilation, air conditioning system. And then district upgrades completely. Fire alarms. There are eight buildings that are going to get fire alarm upgrades. It's over $5 million with the cost. This stuff costs a lot of money when you have to think about the, the wiring and hardware throughout an entire building. High School North has had work done. Grover has worked on in the 15 addition. In other words, this section plus the classrooms we built, that, that's all up to code. Anything, everything else needs to be rewired across this district. A lot, of, a lot of work there. Generators, South, Grover, Community, Village, Millstone. We did a generator at North uh, a couple years ago because that's where the MDF room is. That's the big technology closet, the hardware, the brain of the district with respect to technology. So upgrades to the size of the generators at those other schools. That does not mean we won't do generators at other schools. It means we might do them through another funding mechanism. And that's the big picture overview. I know I have George standing here that can answer some specific questions. It's a ton of stuff to process. We're going to have months of ongoing conversations about this work. But that is $115 million work for zero tax impact in an hour presentation. There will be a tax impact, not for the buildings, but for the teachers that go in the building. I'm specifically talking about the facility increases. Okay. okay. My question is, will these additions to various schools look like and blend into the existing schools? Because with this addition, it looks very expensive and unnecessary, and that's why residents were upset about this. It doesn't really look like a school from the outside. So I'm concerned that the additions look like the existing schools. Well, this section, in fairness, is not the school section. So it was, gonna be, it was designed specifically to look like a board office or to look different. If you look at the way the school itself section was matched and how the way the paving blends through, Thank you, Mr. Dalton. And how it, how it blends through and how the stone matches and the design matches, that was very intentional. In fact, that work's been done, and I'll let, I'll let Mr. Duthie talk about his conceptual design work. So this, this is a George question. 
Well, that's a good question. Uh, I think the best way to answer it is it depends on the site, and it depends on we're trying to establish, I think, an image for West Windsor Plainsboro, and I, I don't know that this building is actually the right building to be looking at as far as the image for a school, because this, isn't, this was intended to be a different type of building than a school, as Dave alluded to. But I think if we look at the proposed addition to Maurice Hawk Elementary School, I would like to think of that as being kind of the thinking going behind the design of all of the additions to the schools proposed in the, dis in the district. It's, every building is different in terms of its context, its siting, its placement, you know, the, the building that it's attaching to, and the image that the school district wishes to convey. So, uh, a great deal of thought will be done in terms of what those buildings are going to look like. Not every building is gonna look the same. I don't see that happening. And we'll do a series of design exercises to look at the types of design language and the image that you want to convey for each building. Okay? I have a question. My other but question is, um, I know there are currently quite a few local dance schools. And if we all of a sudden have a dance program in the WWP schools, will all those local dance schools be put out of business? And is that a good thing? Well, uh, if it follows the tutoring industry, it only enhance it. Um, so uh, the bigger question is, will they want to rent our facilities? And, and, and the, what I would envision that we're going to have to address the facilities use um, policy with respect to specific types of facilities and add in a, uh, to w either a way to either rent it or to protect it um, as an asset. And as all these theaters get redesigned, I think the same question is going to co come to those. Because where our facilities get damaged is with not our students, but outside use groups. Um, so it's something to be thinking about. Um, at the end of the day, my concern is not the private companies, but ultimately the instructional program for the students. And if we look at the requirements under the arts and the recommendation from the Department of Education is to have a four-prong arts program. We have three of the four prongs. We will never have the fourth prong if we don't address the facilities need. So from a curriculum and program standpoint, uh, I know we've had community members request dance, and we've had no opportunity to bring in dance. I've successfully been able to start a dance program in another district and a theater program in another district. Um, and to that, the board had to create facility. We created a dance studio that replicated the state theater up in New Brunswick, and we built a, a theater program. Here, we've been able to replicate a theater program and design a theater program uh, that's running at both high schools, but we do not have the facility for the dance uh, program. Our recommendation is to create the fourth prong of the arts program, um, and I believe it's something our community will support and have a desire for. Um, and so that's why we built it into the referendum to address a missing gap in our program. Do you have students who are, have expressed an interest in that? We have students interested. If we offered it, it will fill. And again, it's just a matter, it's gonna, the question really is gonna be as it builds, is it gonna build um, two sections and three sections or is it gonna build at five sections? So the question ultimately will be the staffing. And so is it one teacher or is it two teachers? Or is it ultimately capped out with two teachers at each building? So it's really going to be driven on student requests. Um, but we firmly believe that this would be just another mechanism of meeting one's arts requirement. And su surprisingly or not, there are students that would prefer not to meet their arts requirement through drawing, through dance, or through, th or through music, or through theater. But they prefer to meet their art requirement um, through dance. OK. OK. Louisa? Oh, Carol, I would just add that my daughter did dance. And the girls that do dance in a serious way even a district program would just be a tiny portion oh, yeah. of the amount of dance they would do. Because if you're serious about dance, you're doing like five classes a week. And it's not, and we're not in the same realm there. Um, Dave, I had a question. Um, you mentioned that all of this work would get us about, I think, capacity for a thousand additional students. I, have you had an opportunity to take your district classroom capacity chart? and update it to show what the new... I haven't, but I can. Okay. And, that and would it, be hard. That would be 
helpful. Can, yeah, I can definitely do that. And then remind me, if you could remind us in a footnote, I believe the district utilization capacity is some percentage of the maximum capacity. That's that's a kind of a Elementary, goal. Elementary, it's at 85% utilization rate. High school, middle school, it's 90%. Uh, okay. No, let me flip that. It's 90% utilization rate. When elementary. You, when you redo the chart, if you would footnote that yep. so that I don't have yep. to ask you again when I yeah, forget. No problem. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I know, good question. And, and it, it, you know, it's the thousand is my estimate, doing quick math. I think one of the important things is knowing the value of science in our community, either renovation or addition, it's 24 science classroom in this referendum. It's one question. So if you're pro-science, you have to also like culinary arts, and you also have to like air at High School North Mills, uh, Millstone in, in Wyckoff. So it's one question. One question, 115 million, zero tax impact on the facilities portion of the debt. Or we can be like, we can let the debt expire, or let the, let the, the money expire, wait a couple of years, and then crush the taxpayer with a massive tax increase. And all you have to do is look in the newspaper at Princeton well, to talk about what the, what the yearly impact is going to be on the taxpayer. Well, question, in or, addition to that, you could delay it, but and spend more later, but in the meantime, you still have to house the students that show up. And, and, and meet the instructional programs that they desire, absolutely. Yeah, or limit them and tell them they can't have what we want to give them, you know, what they'd like. Right. And, and in some of these cases, these are children that exist in this district today. Yeah, do you have a, an idea in mind of how many years it will take to build all these additions in this referendum? Uh, into my next contract. <laughs> no, it will take, it will take in, in all seriousness, referendum goes through in 2018, November 2018. Um, you're, at that point, you're actively building Maurice Hawk. You're moving towards um, bidding out town center at that point. Uh, those projects will both take about a year and a half, um, a year and a half to two years for, for the full build out between the two projects. At the same time, you'll start working towards the paperwork process, the, the finalizing of conceptual designs on advanced projects, um, and then start launching for the following summer of summer 19. Um, some of the work moves differently depending on expansion versus, versus um, air quality. For instance, you're gonna wanna, we're going to want to move on north because of the lead time on building that system. Community or existing children today going to that facility. We're going to want to move on community. We're going to want to move relatively quick on Grover. And quite frankly, we're going to want to move really quick on south. So I would venture to guess when those projects get started somewhere between summer 19 from bidding perspective and awarding and mobilizing to summer 20, each project in itself will be two to three years and summers to get that through. So we're talking about if all the referendum projects, four to five years for full, for full build out of, of all those phasings. Because the other thing to remember is like community, try to think about how you structure that work with kids there and staff there when you're talking about the corridors of the cafeteria, the music room, the, the, the theater all those conversions. Now, there's a lot of work that can happen on the outside. The expansion of the main office, the nurse's office, all that, you can build that and then break through the wall. You can build the two-story expansion. You can build the new library. In fact, you have to build the new library to move the current library out because you can't just put the books in the hallway, right? You can build the new gym before you convert it. So there's certain work that can be done, but you have to layer that work over summers for all the interior conversions. And so it's going to take a lot of coordination with contractors and architects and site managers, because quite frankly, our building and grounds guys alone can't manage all this. Um, and, and there's not enough of us to be at every building. We don't all have the technical expertise. We're good, but we don't have the technical expertise to talk about all, all the intricacies of every HVAC unit. So we're gonna need a lot of timing. So my guess, soup to nuts, every part of this, it's probably, we're talking four and five years. And will, who will be, from an administration point of view, uh, the point person for all of this. There's so many projects that mo reality is that uh, Mr. Dalton's replacement, Dr. Russo, and myself will most likely, from a central office perspective, be assigned to be the point of different projects because we're talking seven. When you add in the two moving outside the referendum, seven facility expansions. Um, so that means seven different job meetings and all that kind of stuff every two weeks. We'll probably, and then there's all the administration and staff to be mindful and responsible for. I would envision the three of us, three roles, would be splitting up this, the point work, point and person work to specific projects. And we'd look at scope and sequence and timings and all that kind of stuff. 
Okay, my other question is on High School South. Um, you're adding some classrooms. Did you look at putting those classrooms in what is now the open area to, the to get rid of the whole security problem in the open area? Yeah, like Commons 1, 2, 3, you mean? Or do you mean like the open space area? Open space. So if you add walls to, common, to the, the open space classrooms, the five, six, seven, hundred, eight, uh, 800 areas, you actually will lose existing classroom space. Um, so you'll, based on footprint of square footage, you'll actually lose rooms, not be able to add rooms. Um, the other thing is just from a Why? facility, uh, well, because the walls will take up square footage and hallways are then required and, you know, there's, there's, and there's certain code requirements of length of hallways, so it actually will eat into the footprint. It's a very unique design that I can't imagine the Department of Ed going for now. If this board ever wanted to get into a conversation of repurposing the five, six, seven, eight hundred wing, you might as, you're gonna have to shut south down for two years to do that work. Uh, I, in, in any steel work you have to do in there, any kind of enclosures, I've been asked about second floors. This guy will tell you anything can be done because he, he doesn't think about the price on the front end. He thinks about the conceptual design. So he's right. For, for conceptually, we can do a lot. We can add a second floor. We could put up walls. The price to do all that and the time to do all that and then the, where do you physically put the students and the staff during that time period, whole different conversation to the point where it's undoable. Also, I add that however you configure the open space area, it doesn't make space for more kids. All you're doing is building walls around the existing ones. I, I, so you, I've looked at the size of some of those spaces and yeah. you will definitely lose, lose. classrooms. The, uh, the other thing that happens, I know this was discussed in, uh, in 2006 when we went through the last renovation. You close those off, now you have all sorts of ventilation issues to deal with. Lighting and ventilation. You know. Exiting. exiting. It, yeah. So there's a lot of corridors that have to be created that eat up space that are currently classroom spaces now because the whole layout has to be different from movable yeah. walls and movable furniture. It, and it's uh, and, it, and very honest, we have talked about that because um, hmm. we looked at we tried to look at every option through this. Yeah, Rachel? Just a clarification question: You'd mentioned about four to five years of build out. Is there a if we were to do the referendum and if it passed, is there a specific time frame that you're supposed to spend that money? Uh, is there a requirement, whether it's a legal requirement as part yeah, of the I referendum? I see both Dr. Russo and, and Mr. Duthi shaking their head no. So, so if, if a project um, was authorized two years from now and it actually took six years to make, which, look, some of these things, and, and uh, Tony might be able to recall through the referendum that was done for the South expansion, uh, that went through in 2006. Six. I came in in 2009 and the, the bubble portion of the referendum finished in December of 2009. Uh, and that was a 2006 pass in, the, in that. That was one expansion. And so now you're layering seven, well, five expansions in the referendum and two outside the, re the referendum. The possibility for something to delay a year is not, is not uncommon when you're moving that many contractors at that point. But you also want to start to authorize the work earlier than later before interest rates start going up and before other things that drive the prices up. So there is a, there is a financial and logistical advantage to moving earlier if you can capture the interest rates at a lower rate, too. I have a question. Um, are you, how are we intending to communicate this to the public? I know tonight's meeting and putting it on, are you anticipating any sort of public meetings? Do you have uh, a plan we're, for that yet? We're, we're working on what that will look like. We have met with one, um, one company that specifically helps with referendum work. Quite frankly, some of the proposal we like and some of the proposal we're gonna push back on. Um, some of the things we think we can do ourselves, uh, you see uh, Jamie here, and, and one of the things we've already set up time for is, is to start building videos for each building this summer so that we can start getting and, 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 myself and Mr. Duthi and, and the building principals to talk about the facility expansions so we can have videos per building set up because for some members of the community, um, we, you know, I, I did, uh, they're gonna see it visually, they're gonna see it on the, the video and they're only gonna be interested in their kids' school. Um, or where their kids are going. Four, uh, we do anticipate, and we're gonna be working with the PTA and PTSA leadership at our, we, at our next meeting is actually the exec boards for all the different organizations. We're gonna be talking about setting up meetings in the fall 
and getting on calendars and setting up a series of meetings in the fall. Quite frankly, I'll be asking some members of the board, I hope members of the board are interested in presenting and coming out to those because it's not just, it wouldn't just, just be the superintendent's referendum. If this gets voted on, it's the board's referendum ultimately and the board needs to be part of the communication and sales pitch. Um, and then there's this whole part of, I talked to some other districts about, um, about their communication strategy. Some board's strategy is only to email district uh, parents. Personally, I think that's unfair to district residents. So in order to then, we don't have an email bank to every homeowner. So the only way to do that is not only put things up on the web and not only put videos up and me have meetings, but actually e uh, mail things out to homeowners. So there are, there are mailers that need to be done which have costs associ associated with them. And that's a, that's a logistical issue. The board might say, you know what, we think we should only email. But if we email, we only then email the emails we have. And that means we're not emailing Village Grant, and we're not emailing other, and I just, uh, personally, I just don't think that's fair. They have a right to vote no as much as they have a right to vote yes as district residents, and they have a right to be informed because they have a right to vote on this. So there'll be a get out the vote campaign because you know we can't say vote yes for no. Clearly, we're, we're bringing this forward, so we want to see um, community support. But there's, again, we think there's a great story here. There's existing um, programmatic need. There's existing space constraints and we know growth is coming. Due to expiring debt, taking advantage of, of um, the, the money that comes back through uh, state aid and utilizing reserves. And you know, we've all heard feedback that our reserve balances are too high. This is an opportunity to give that money back to the community in a way to keep their facility debt portion of the, of, of the, of the budget even. And, and we think there's a great story in that. So we're addressing growth needs, short term and near term. We're addressing facility concerns like air quality issues within multiple buildings. We're addressing science and arts and robotics and dance and libraries and culinary and classroom needs across this district. We're meeting security and life safety needs. So again, we think there's a great story in this and there's something for every member of this community. And if you look at a building like Dutch Neck or Village or um, Hawk, which have minimal things in the referendum, well, your kids are gonna go to Grover and South or community and North. So there's a reason to vote yes through this because your children will be impacted by the, by the changes, uh, programmatically as well as classroom wise. So we're hoping for community support through this. We're hoping they see the method through the madness and then we're hoping they're seeing the multi-year thinking of why we did certain things with certain reserve actions that we have been thinking strategically for years about doing some of this work. And this only happens because we work together in partnership, because we think about budgets in multi-year, because we think about impacts to tax bases, because we think about um, giving a consistency program uh, to, our, to our kids. And, and so, and we do believe there's something for everyone's children in this, in this proposal. So, I'm happy to be done, <laughs> and I'm happy to keep going. So, you tell me if there's other questions. This will not be our last, our last presentation on this. Um, and to Louise's question, the actual structure of what presentations will look like to be developed, but we know that this is requiring a lot of public meetings um, and that we'll be working on putting that plan together. Thank you.